Well, hello there. It's the day of the budget. The first Labour budget in goodness knows how many years. It's a day that maybe gives us all a little bit of hope and a little bit of dread as to what the future might bring. Certainly at the moment, I'm not sure how much hope there is. There's that kind of general feeling of doomedness. We're just all going to be doomed. Kind of feeling, you know. Which I'm sure isn't the case. I'm in Stanley, just to the north of Perth. Visiting Stanley Mills. This is a series of mill buildings that was... Uh, constructed in the 1780s at the same time as the magnificent mill complex at New Lanark was built. I don't think it's quite as grand as New Lanark, but it's getting there. It's, it's, I've fully just arrived, it's looking pretty stunning to me. And it was... I mean, it was put together by a number of local merchants, but it was funded and backed by Richard Arkwright, um, a big player in the, the UK's cotton industry, a pioneer of the factory system, and one of the many fathers of the Industrial Revolution. And he invented a machine that would take the place of many workers as far as the spinning of cotton yarn was concerned. And essentially, I mean, mills like this employed a lot of people, but they would have employed even more people if they weren't the machines that did the work of many of them. And it is in mills like this that we can really start to see the, the very beginnings of man's redundancy. <laughs> the beginnings of uh, the end as far as the working man is concerned the rise of the machines. This is said to be one of Scotland's best preserved relics of the Industrial Revolution. Where they made cotton textiles. I mean, just look at what I presume to be the gatehouse here. Is that not such a, a beautiful little building? You don't see many buildings that look as good as that. It's just stunning, you know. I would come here just to look at that one little building. Forget everything else. There seems to be some fencing up at the moment. I sometimes think when I'm wandering about old sites in Scotland that there's either a, either a group of scaffolders follows me, or in this case we seem to have a group of people who put up metal fences. Don't know why. The fence is there, it's spoiling a few shots for me, but um, there's certainly plenty of the, the rest of the site that's open and available to, um, to have a look at. When I say open, I mean, it, at certain times of the year, uh, you can actually get inside some of the buildings. Uh, it's, they're operated by Historic Environment Scotland. But um, I think that closes about the end of um, September or something like that, you know. We're towards the end of October, so 
the site is closed as far as getting into buildings is concerned, but you can wander around outside of all these magnificent structures. So let's do just that. As I said earlier, even out of season, when you can't get inside the buildings, you can wander around the Stanley Mills and there's plenty of information panels that will give you a flavour of uh, what it was uh, all about. And if, I think one of the panels back there uh, said something along the lines of that there was an earlier mill here, although this complex was built in the 1780s, there was a a corn mill here in the early 18th century and I think um, some of these mill lades were built perhaps at that time for that corn mill and then reused, perhaps rehashed for the, uh, for the cotton mills. You know, it was a, a time in our past when it wasn't just men and women that were becoming surplus to requirements through the use of machines. But because of the, the use of water power and water wheels, horses too were becoming redundant. I found a seat with a table, clearly a special pie table. And this is a mutton pie out of a baker's in South Street in Perth. I forget the name of it, much to my shame. It, it's not Greg's, it's not Bain's, it's the other one. Really good uh, looking mutton pies, you know. Probably the best seated up, you know, like most pies. I mean, a mutton pie is a sort of inexpensive thing. It's a no-frills pie, but it can be very tasty. I sometimes feel that I perhaps should eat a bit more fruit and veg, you know. Unless the... Um, Unless the pastry is veg, is it? No. Pastry is that veg? Is that grown on the ground? It's made of flour. That grows, doesn't it? It could be veg. Then again, maybe not. It's just, it's, I was just talking to somebody there and I was saying, I've never been here before. Why that is, I don't know, because it's absolutely stunning. And as I've said previously, it doesn't have to be open for you to come and visit it, wander around, read all the information panels and just marvel at the series of buildings that makes up this mill site. It is, we're talking 10 out of 10 stuff like, you know. Obviously, once I've done that, you've got an excuse to come back perhaps during the summer when some of the buildings will be open. Have a bit of a gander inside.
so good wandering around, especially this time of year, autumn. You've got all this stunning architecture. You've got the River Tay there, where they, I think, got their power from. Beautiful. What I'll do is I'll just wander around some more, see if I can get some, some more footage and uh, I'll get the bus back to Perth, have a beer, maybe in the Salutation Hotel, I'm not sure, we'll see how we go. Well, I think that's probably about as much wandering around as I can do. I think I'll just head back to Perth now. Or back into Stanley and get a bus to Perth. Quite a few of the, uh, the mill buildings are uh, occupied and used for residential purposes. And that is a good thing, using these old buildings for a good reason. And some of them are, are, some of them are historic environment Scotland and part of the uh, the Mill Museum here when it's open, but as I say, it's not open just now. I mean, I think sometimes when you get a site like this where part of it's used for housing um, and part of it's used for tourist purposes, visitor, a visitor attraction, I, th I think you can perhaps get some tension there where residents can perhaps feel besieged if there are too many visitors and they start to um, feel as if they want to put up the, uh, the drawbridge and or pull up the drawbridge and um, you know just as I was wandering around there I, I kind of I saw a, a, one or two residents and I, I just got that feeling to be honest <laughs> another flaming tourist with a camera kind of feeling you know um, but you know, you, you have to strike, I think, a balance in a, in a in a site like this. Residents have to be understanding of the, the needs of visitors and vice versa. You don't want to be um, wandering into areas of the property where it does say private garden and stuff like that, you know. A wee bit of respect from both sides. Um, I mean, as I was wandering around, a, a chap who, I dare say, was a resident, asked what I was filming. You know, and he, he didn't really say it in a, I'm interested to know what you're doing kind of way. He said it in a slightly domineering, I'm a resident kind of way. And I could sense the phrase, have you got permission, on the tip of his tongue. <laughs> I don't think I need permission. I mean, Historic Environment Scotland did, won't allow you to film in their sites when they're open. It's closed at the moment, you know, as far as the interior of the buildings is concerned. Maybe I've broken some law here. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> anyway, let's have a beer back in Perth. Well, back, back in Perth in the Salutation Hotel, in the Stuart room in fact. Th this room is actually uh, meant and kept aside for, for meetings and things. It's not part of the bar or anything like that. I had to ask if this was okay to come up here. It was in fact the room uh, that was used by Prince Charles Edward Stuart and his generals uh, for a council of war. Not that I'm planning to hold a council of war or anything. But for some reason, I just thought I'd end here. In relation to the Stanley Mills and the, the, the textile industry, I talked about Richard Arkwright, pioneer of the factory system, who machines took over the work of, uh, of men. And I, I just see it as the, the beginning of uh, the end for the working man because as the centuries have gone by we've seen more and more machines take over the, the task once carried out by men and women. 
you know, in the supermarkets we're using machines at checkout. Railway stations are an awful lot of them are unmanned and you have to use a machine to buy your ticket. I mean it was it wasn't that long ago that the, the, the railway stations had station masters and men who would cart your luggage about, they had a waiting room with a real fire. That's all gone and been replaced with plastic boxes on platforms where you've got a sloping seat that you're meant to try and feel comfortable on after buying your ticket from a machine. It's, you know, you have to wonder what the men, the mankind will do once machines fully take over, as they probably will at some point, you know. But I think in relation to the textile industry, in the Scottish borders, we once had a vibrant textile industry, which has now vanished, like far too many of Scotland and the UK's industries. I was reading somewhere that India, became independent in 1947 and they imposed import tariffs on cotton goods to protect their growing industry. Why could the UK government do, not do that to protect UK jobs and industry, to protect the textile industry in the Scottish borders, to stop companies like Marks and Spencers having their wares, underpants, socks, shirts, made in places like India and China. You know, was it the case that the UK government uh, sought to destroy much of Scotland's main industrial heart? To turn the country into an industrial wasteland where we had to go cap in hand to Westminster. Why did the UK government not protect UK jobs and industry in the same way that other countries have done? That's a very big question. I'm Eddie Burns. Take care and I'll see you again.